This week on the It's a Monkey podcast. In order to communicate it to the AIs and robots, we actually have to sharpen up our own version of it. And in that process, we're going to make ourselves better. And we saw the same thing with chess. When, when, the, when this AI, Deep Blue, beat the world's best chess player, you would think, well, that's the end of a, of humans playing chess. But it wasn't. Actually, what happened was all these people started to play against computer chess became really, really cheap. And today, the best player that has ever lived has become really good because they've been playing against computers. So it just made it made humans better at it. So 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 already the the, the AIs are teaching us how to be better chess players. They'll teach us how to be better pilots. They'll be teach us how to be better judges and ethics and teachers. And so they are helping us to make ourselves better. Good morning, good evening, hello, wherever you are in the world. My name is Kevin Garber. I am the CEO of Manage Flitter and soon to be Manage Social as well. I'm coming to you, um, I nearly said live, sort of live recorded from um, Sydney, Australia. It is Friday, the 28th of July. Um, we're nearly into the, the, the downhill latter part of the year. Thank you so much for listening to the show. Um, excited to say that this is episode number 100. So uh, there is, uh, you know, we're tipping into over 100 podcast episodes. We started this podcast in August 2012, which is five years ago now. I remember when I started the podcast that I committed to sticking with the podcasts and blogging or infamous in that you um, start them and, and, and they just fizzle. And I just didn't want to be a statistic. So I'm happy to say not only have we uh, made episode number 100, but that we've actually got an incredibly special interview that I managed to organize for this episode with Kevin Kelly. Now, some of you that have been around the internet for a little while will remember Wired Magazine. Now, Kevin Kelly was one of the people that was instrumental in uh, getting Wired Magazine going. He's been around the internet for a long time, and he's actually just released a new book a little while back called The Inevitable, Understanding the 12 Technological Forces that Will Shape our future and it's such a fantastic book and I reached out uh, when the book came out a few uh, probably I think it was uh, last year sometime I reached out via his website and his assistant was very kind and said Kevin's not doing any interviews at the moment but next year I'll get back to you didn't think much of it and uh, they set up an interview which was fantastic so I'm going to play that later on in the show so very special for episode 100 Kevin Kelly who's uh, um, the author of of the book and he's a futurist and and very well respected person in our industry and um, interestingly Kevin's penned tweet on his Twitter account is over the long term the future is decided by optimists and what I love so much about Kevin's book is it paints a very rosy picture of uh, the future that's positively influenced by technology it's so easy these days to get dystopian about everything and uh, I, I left feeling so filled up about why I got interested and involved in the technological industry um, it, I was very much reminded when I was actually I was listening to the audio version of Kevin's book um, before we continue, almost but nearly forgot about my co-host, Kate Frappel, who's the design leader at Manage Flitter. It's a little bit easier to forget about you now, Kate, because uh, you're not sitting in front of me. you at the end of my Skype. I'm looking at you on the video from uh, Whistler in Canada. Thanks uh, for joining us. <laughs> no worries. Um, Kate, as usual, we're going to kick off. Uh, well, actually, before we kick off with a new story, I'll tell you what, why don't we just not get too self-indulgent, but have a quick, quick listen to that episode one intro, August 2012. Let's just play this intro uh, just for nostalgia's sake, and then we'll get back to regular programming. Welcome, welcome to the first episode number one of It's a Monkey podcast. My name is Kevin Garber. I am the CEO and co-founder of 89N, which of course is the home of Managed Flitter and a few other bits and pieces. And with me, I also have my other co-founder, um, James Peter. Welcome, James. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, it's exciting. Yeah, first podcast. First podcast. I hope it's not the... Um, last well it won't be the last <laughs> <laughs> no, no i'm sure people will like this one and uh and yeah it'll be be great to see how it goes and uh we spent quite a bit of time putting all the the gear together so um i'm quite excited to have this sort of professional setup and um yeah 
And um, if you are listening to this podcast, just be a little bit patient with us because we have been screaming up the audio learning curve and we've got a little bit of a way to go, but hopefully the production value will get better and better each time we've got the right equipment now we just have to get our head around it so we actually have a very exciting show lined up for you so anyway kate five years later we still we still here uh, james used to be the co-host and now james is doing off doing his own thing he's doing well and uh you have the the pain and pleasure of being the co-host but we're still around right definitely that's a good achievement five years is a is a solid effort I always think some uh, solitary confinement punishment in prison would just be to just sit and just push play on number one and have someone just suffer through, you know, 120 hours worth of uh, um, podcasts. But yeah, I'd, uh, you know, what's so exciting as well, the last year, I really, uh, I, I made an effort to, to reach out to, you know, people I've always wanted to chat about and, um, you know, not to say that we've ever... Um, and poor, you know, I've always, I've always enjoyed the guests on our show, but I guess we've tried to, um, you know, reach out to slightly higher profile guests, guests that we've thought, um, you know, and have been more difficult to lock down. And, um, you, you know, people are very interested in hearing from personalities in our industries, uh, industry. So, um, you know, we're happy to say we've had some fantastic people over the last year. And in general, over the last five years, we've had some fantastic people. And I'm, you know, very grateful to everyone who's been so generous with their time. A lot of, the, you know, a lot of the time people don't really get anything out of it and they are happy to, to help us. So it's, it's been a fantastic ride. Um, and uh, we hopefully we'll continue for, for uh, let's onwards to 200, right? Definitely, definitely. I think um, I was listening to episode one recently and yourself and James are talking about Medium just being released. And like now I think about where Medium is now and how big it is. It's, um, yeah, it's just interesting. Time flies. It does, right? Yeah, Medium didn't even exist. There's, you know, platforms become very established in our industry very quickly. And you, you look back and it's you know, wow! You you spoke about it when it just when it just started. So um, that's the exciting thing about our industry. And Kevin talks about this in the book, where where every chapter in our industry, especially as entrepreneurs, it's very easy to sometimes feel like you've missed the boat, right? You know, but but our industry is always ending and always beginning. You know, so yeah. it's 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 we always got to. You know, people may feel that they've missed. I don't know the the you know SEO boats or whatever it is, but there's there's always new beginnings, you know, which is so exciting about our industry, and it's it's the the, the velocity and the and, and the cycles have become so compressed. But um, yeah, it's it, Kevin really really captures so much in the book, and I was I was uh, very happy that we managed to organize a chat with him. He's 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 such a brilliant writer. He he just really captures you know, you know smart people and brilliant writers. They almost when you read it, you're like, yes, that's it, right? <laughs> and you have that, yes. that, that, and, but they say it in a way that you sort of wished you could say. Definitely. I feel like that with, um, a lot of quotes or, um, like I'll find paragraphs in books where I'm like, oh, that's just so well written. Like I just want to frame it or something. Yeah. It's, it's, it's definitely, it's, it's in the pursuit of, you know, the perfect communication. We all, we all try to use words, but uh, that there's, there's not many of us that are as, uh, you know, and that's why I guess these people are, are famous authors and, and, you know, successful at it because that's their superpower, you know. Anyway, let's get right into it. We're going to play the, the, the interview with Kevin very shortly, so stick around. We're going to keep this, our preamble and post analysis very short this week because I want the, the interview with Kevin sort of really to, to be the main um, thrust of this week's podcast. Remember, you can email us at podcast at itsamonkey.com tweet us we love to hear from you we can see you listening on our stats we know you're there I'm glad you're enjoying this show kate let's just touch on one news item this week what's happening out there in our in our industry so this uh this week i've discovered an article where lg are starting to test some robots in uh one of the major international airports in south korea so they're preparing that for the winter olympics and one robot is acting as a guide and the second air um sorry one robot is a guide and the second robot is a cleaner so it's like interesting experiment and um i'd like to see whether they're going to build out more of them in time for the olympics you know what i was thinking today was um 
about this whole robot story. You know, uh, these days we connected to everything the whole time and, and we virtually connected through social media networks and, and phones and um, email and things like that. Essentially, we're never really alone unless you really make a super effort. I think, I think the robots are going to take it to the next level where not only we're going to not be virtually alone, we're actually not going to be physically alone there are going to be i mean i think in japan there's already companion robots um and you know visiting our dear team member jimmy who was on the the bitcoin podcast a few episodes ago who's been in a hospital after a bad accident seeing how many nurses they have there and you can see the temptation if you get it right to replace these these industries where there's a, a high demand for for people being around and doing, um, you know, a lot of the same task is very tempting. So I can see, I can see why. And airports, I guess, is one of these places where there's a lot of people with a lot of the same questions and in a high pressure environment. So any way that can help easily and cheaply and in a scalable way makes sense. Yeah, I mean, these um, particular robots as well can take your boarding pass and they will direct you to, like, your gate, for example. I just feel like the the limitation would probably be if you were in a rush that the robot would be at like quite a steady speed and if you needed to run <laughs> it probably wouldn't be the greatest of help. And you can picture when you ask this robot and say, you know, where's my gate? And it says, sorry, you've just missed it by three minutes and people just bashing this robot, <laughs> you know, yeah. shaking it. No, what do you mean? I mean, it's still such early days and I spoke about it in one of the previous podcasts, again at the hospital where Jimmy's at, where um, they've got an, 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 for lack of a word, an industrial robot. So it's, the, you know, it doesn't look like a humanoid, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's almost a robotic trolley mover that moves trolleys of linen around the hospital without any humans and moves it in and out and lifts and up and down and remarkable you know just really remarkable to see this thing in action just going about its business um <laughs> so it it'll be interesting to see what what time period all these this robot technology will um you know happen i think there's certain use cases where where it would be fantastic, you know, even in hospitals of, you know, sometimes the nurses are just literally coming around and giving you three pills, right? And then you take three pills. I mean, it doesn't really need to, it's nice for it to be a human, but it doesn't really need to be. And wouldn't it be greater if, if you know, there's people without health care, if you can, you know, the scalability just helps with access. You know, that's the spirit of this all is not just to save money. But the spirit is to to make the spirit of technology, I believe, is to genuinely help us live a better life and help to uplift, uplift people to the life, the privileged life that we are having. You know, that's the spirit of the, the technology. Yeah, definitely. I can't help thinking as well that, you know, if they introduce it in a event such as the Olympics, um, people are already in a they're already in a good mood, like psychologically, they're more accepting of of these robots and so if you introduce it in a, a big event with lots of people like that then it sort of extends and gets bigger and bigger from there yeah and uh, you know that part of the world korea japan they 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 really i mean i mean tokyo when i was there a few years ago they got a robot restaurant i didn't actually you go to it but it's it's already a thing and you know they got the companion robots there mm. but um let's uh yeah it's it's you know, and loneliness is such a problem in cities. You know, it's, it's Freud said the price of civilization is neurosis, you know, meaning that, that cities, cities cause a lot of problems. They're very convenient and they, they, there's a lot of benefits. But, and, you know, mental health in Australia, I'm sure in, in, in America as well, I, I don't know about other countries, it's just there's a, there's a lot of challenges with it. And, um, you know, I'm not saying robots are the answer to it all, but... I don't know, Kate, if robots get as good as humans and you can't tell the difference, if you literally can't tell the difference, right? And if we get to mm. that stage, does it really matter if you talk to someone, especially like say an old person if you, and, and, it, and, it, and it's a robot and it, and it learns over time through AI and machine learning and it learns just almost like a human learns and remembers, will, would the satisfaction be the same even if the person knows that it's a robot but it looks exactly like a person there's a interesting episode on uh black mirror that's sort of very similar to what you're saying and um yeah i'm not sure i'm not sure i think that it would have its limitations eventually 
there would be things, um, you know, from the past or while the robot was learning, you would start to realize that it wasn't a human. It wouldn't be the same, I don't think. Yeah. I mean, in some cases, like potentially for, for elderly people, if they're just wanting to chat or play a game or something like that, that would be helpful. But I think, I guess, more for the everyday or middle, middle-aged and younger person, I don't think it could replace a human interaction easily. Yeah, I think we're going to get there. I think we're going to get there. Um, I, think- I think we would notice gaps. In, in the robot's knowledge and, like, empathy, emotion. I don't know. That, I think it, ha- it has to have time to learn and develop those skills and yep. learn what you like and your history and stuff. But if you, yeah, unless you were born beside it and it grew up with you. Well, there's an then, interesting question, right? There's a really yeah. interesting question. If you get born with a robot next to you that, that learns with you, I mean, would you would you develop some some sort of feelings and and love to it you know it's and and connection Mm. i guess is the word that i'm looking for so you're right if they if someone gets born into a world where that's all they know yeah if you were born alongside it and it learned at the same rate as you and it remembered it had the same type of memory or better then i think you could have a potentially a decent relationship with a robot but if I was to get one now, for example, it wouldn't know my life to date and it would have to learn about me, learn what I liked. And, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I think I would, um, I would notice. You know, you know, it would be, be the same. you know, it's interesting is that if we have robots in our life, they're going to remember our life better than us. Sort of like the yep. Facebook reminder, right? Where it pops up and it says, mm-hmm. three years ago, you shared this and you're like, I totally forgot about that. Yeah. You know? yeah, and so the robot's going to actually remember, you know, your life better than you, which is sort of what Facebook does. You know, we 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 live in sort of daytight compartments in a way with little bits and pieces of other things, but machines don't live in daytight compartments. They constantly are living in from the beginning to now, right? But what's interesting is, sure. you know, Kevin Kelly makes the point in the interview, and I won't I won't sort of give it all away, but and in his book as well, where he says. You know, the path towards AI and machine learning and robotics is not is really not going to be this human replacement, you know, clone. And that, that's really unlikely to happen. It's more going to be in these niche areas that it's going to, you know, where there's going to be a device that's incredibly good at one thing or two mm-hmm. things. And, and AI and machine learning is going to really help on that side of things. It's very much more unlikely that it's going to be complete human improvement so i found that an interesting point and that's that's already true you look at cars they've got all sorts of technology in them and smart thermostats and pacemakers and you know so so that it was an interesting point yeah yeah i think if you can as you're saying limit limit the ability of the robots then the distinction between human and robot remains um once you try and make robots in your own image then you're going to come across problems and blurry lines. Ah, yes. I could talk about this forever, Kate. It's just so <laughs> <laughs> it's so interesting. But we're going, to, we're going to take a short break. And after the break, we're going to play my chat I had with Kevin Kelly, who is a senior maverick at Wired and author of the best-selling book, The Inevitable, Understanding the 12 Technological Forces That Will Shape Our Future. Um, Kevin's a fantastic writer. Buy the book, listen to the audio, and hope you will find this audio interesting. And um, we're going to be back after this break with the interview with Kevin Kelly. Hi, my name is Joe Pinto. I'm the business operations manager here at Manage Flitter. Did you know that Manage Flitter can help you quickly and cheaply build an organic following on Twitter? Let me explain in six easy steps. Step one. Find new prospects on Twitter with Power Mode, Manage Flitter's advanced Twitter search feature. Step two, easily filter and sort results to find the most relevant Twitter accounts for you to follow. Step three, follow these Twitter accounts using Manage Flitter's simple interface. Step four, unfollow accounts that do not follow you back within 14 days. Step five, Watch your Twitter follower numbers grow as high-quality accounts follow you back. 
Step 6. Rinse and repeat to maintain consistent organic Twitter account growth. Feel free to drop by manageflitter.com to trial our product or email us at contact at manageflitter.com to schedule an obligation-free walkthrough. You're back with it to Monkey Podcast. Now we chat about everything relating to tech, startup, entrepreneurship, political economy. Now when I was uh, back in Johannesburg many, many years ago and the internet was just flapping its wings um, and I was excitedly getting into it, I started reading a magazine called Wired Magazine that just started opening my eyes to this new, wide, incredible world of the internet. And I'm very excited to say today's guest on the podcast is a co-founder of Wired Magazine who joined Wired in, in 1993 and served as its executive editor for the first seven years. A very uh, esteemed author whose latest book is The Inevitable, which is a New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestseller and also has the title of being called uh, by Tim Ferriss as the most interesting man in the world. So I'd like to welcome Kevin Kelly to our podcast. Hey, thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure being here. Um, how do you feel about having that title from Tim Ferriss, Kevin? I didn't understand for a long time, but I think it may be a joke on the Dos Equis um, commercial right? where I have a white beard that's probably not that different from the original guy. So... Um, Tim's a fan. I'm a fan of Tim. We've done some traveling just recently. We went to Uzbekistan together. And um, he's a teacher, and uh, he sort of enjoys things I have to say. And so we have a mutual admiration club going. <laughs> I did listen to that podcast, and it sounded like um, a lot of fun. It's, it's, um, it, it seems like you, um, you really enjoy traveling, and you, I mean, you comment about how you're your book was an attempt at sort of viewing technology as you view the world when you travel, right? My Yeah, the very first, uh, one of the very first cover stories I ever wrote was on the emerging online world, which I covered as if it was a new country, which it was kind of at the time. And I had, I, I was a travel writer and since I was, I was writing about travel and so this was a natural fit in describing this emerging continent of the online world um, in, a, in a kind of like a travel guide. I remember the very first time that I saw the World Wide Web, and it was with one of my father's friends. It was a chap from Argentina, and um, he fired up the Mosaic browser, and he, and he literally said, when I am on the web, I feel like I am Christopher Columbus. Those were his exact mm -hmm. words. So your metaphor really rings true. Well, there was the Netscape Navigator, and that was um, the, you know, basically the, the offspring of, of Mosaic was Netscape, and it was called the Navigator. Now, of course, you were involved in one of the, the really first virtual communities, um, The Well, which I believe I was surprised to read is still active and still going <laughs> to this day. Yeah, active maybe. It's still alive, right. put it that way. Um, the Well was um, one of the original, an original online community, and like a lot of the earliest um, bulletin boards, it was kind of a jacked up bulletin board. Um, people, it was self-contained in the sense that people generally emailed other people on the service and that's how Prodigy was. And, and even AOL at the very beginning, you could only closed communicate wall. with closed wall, closed garden. You can only communicate with other people on the service. And so we had a very, we, the well, um, had a very eclectic group of people, including the deadhead, the fans of the Grateful Dead. We had a lot of organic farmers, teachers, and a lot of journalists. Uh, and it was a, we were kind of pioneering what it meant to have an online community, what it meant to have threads and forums, which were all brand new. But the real, um, the real work began after a kind of a very long campaign. We were able to um, connect the well to the Internet at large, this other thing that was going on. That was the the network of networks. That was the internet. Was so they would, it was connecting all the networks like the well together. And um, in the old days, the days prior to that, you needed to have either uh, .edu an educational or .government 
address to get onto the internet. And um, the big thing holding it up was that the internet at that time, run by the NSF, National Science Foundation, prohibited commercial activity. That's fascinating. And so they, yeah, and so they wouldn't let us on because they said, how can we, how can we, the well, how can we guarantee that there wouldn't be some commercial activity happening? And, you know, it's like, well, I don't know how, of course there's going to be commercial activity. But we finally brokered an agreement where there was a, you know, one of those, agreements, those terms of service that nobody reads that says, I'm, I promise not to do commercial activity on this thing. And the, you agreed to yes, and then you were on the internet. So we were selling basically uh, public access to the internet for the first time. And that was what really kind of transformed the well, where you could not just email people on the well, but you could email people in the government, people who worked in a dot .com, people who worked for an uh, educational, anybody who was getting these new email addresses. And that kind of tipped the, the, the entire community in, into, the, into the real world in some senses. And um, it's later, it was very slow to migrate to a user. So, so a, a, a anything you did, you had to kind of type and you had to use command codes. And it was very, very, very nerdy and geeky, which limited the number of people. And it was very, very slow to, to take up a graphical user interface. The AOL did that very early because they were on the Mac only. And um, we were a nonprofit, didn't have the resources to invest into a user interface. So um, it was a long time coming. There are still some people, and I think they're the same people who are using it and having a fun old time, you know, arguing and debating <laughs> with, and yeah. flaming and all that kind of stuff. Um, but because of that, I had an early experience in what online communities were were like and the the, na the texture and the nature of the online world that gave me great confidence to extrapolate where it was going and you know it was not it came not from reading things but it came from spending a long time working on the well and living in those online communities that gave me the confidence to say you know this stuff is real this is really going to go mainstream kevin do you think it's significant that the internet was developed essentially uh, you know by the government for lack of a better word in, in a in a society where we claim that capitalism pulls us forward in so many ways that that arguably the most significant development of our generation was actually created by a government committee essentially yes i think we terribly under appreciate under recognize the role of government in um, a lot of these um, very instrumental inventions. I mean, of course, it was not just the internet, but later on, the browser was in, the web was invented at CERN, which was a which was a government funded thing. And so, um, there was a, a gal who spoke at our long now seminars on long term thinking, um, who made a list of all the ways in which even say the iPhone, there was, you know, GPS technologies, there, there was, there was just a lot of things that came out of government funding. And, um, there's two things to say about it. One is, yeah, we should absolutely recognize it. And the kind of really radical right disparaging of government is totally, totally wrong that, um, government is, is capable of, doing these kinds of investments. And secondly, we should do more of it. We should do a lot more of it. We should stop you know, spending trillions of dollars on useless wars and spend trillions of dollars on science and- the NASA, uh, right? Everything. And <laughs> it, it, would, it would pay a hundredfold. It would pay back a hundredfold. And so, uh, and right now, you know, this is my advice to, to China and other countries saying, how do we, you know, how do we take a lead in innovation? It's like, well, start funding basic science and research and education because those will pay back so, so great. And not everything will work, of course. And government is allergic to failure, of course. But, you know, just multiply it by 10, do 10 times as much, just even as we're doing it now, just do 10 times as much and um, we'll have 100 times the benefit. 
Kevin, I don't know if you're uh, aware that in Australia, the government gives a, a R&D tax benefit to any organization that can argue that some of their activities during the financial year have gone towards R&D, and it's a self-assessment. Um, so it's quite generous by the Australian government. Yeah, you know, I, I think more like that is needed worldwide, and um, you know, more power to you. That's that's really great. Um, I'm sure I have no doubt that it pays for itself in the long term. Uh, one statement that uh, you said, Kevin, on the AMA on Reddit a little while ago, which caught my eye, which I'd like you to unpack a little bit, um, just going on a little bit of a tangent, where you said, I think in 200 years, people will look back on eating wild animal flesh as unthinkable. Um, curious, what's curious, is that um, relating to the, the industrialized food industry? Is it relating to meat that will be able to be harvested cruelty-free? Where does that statement sort of uh, um, sort of relate to? What does it relate to? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there is, you know, even the best practices, there is there is some level of violence necessary to make meat from live animals um and even though you know in the best practices that's kept to a minimum is still basically kind of gruesome and so um I, I i but you know our appetite for it is undiminished and so i think there's really no way around that until we kind of invent this a whole sub genre of you know deathless meat meat um that's flesh that's grown in vats that may in some ways be superior either in taste or nutrition to the stuff that we get from killing animals and if that were to take off there will certainly always be people who you know like who like wild game who would want to have you know live animals killed and there will be a certain cachet to that because it'll probably be more expensive maybe there'll be some taste but i think the bulk in the long term the bulk of our meat could certainly come from uh things that were i mean they may even be living in some weird way um but maybe not living as animals or maybe they don't have brains or i don't know what it is there'll be all different versions of it i have a friend the science fiction author Daniel Suarez, who has a new book called Change Agent, there he writes science fiction thrillers. He coined a really cool term. He, he called the people who would only eat this stuff, he called them degans because they would only be um, death free, deathless meat eaters. And uh, I, I could certainly kind of see that happening. And maybe that was sort of this. So, so the inspiration was this idea that. Um, you know, the civilized person in the future, in the far future, would, uh, just as we don't eat a lot of, like, wild animals, we could. There's, we probably wouldn't eat a lot of live meat or formerly live meat. They would certainly be there, but most of it would probably be death-free meat. Social norms are so interesting and so powerful. There's currently a big debate going on about meat in Bali, where actually I believe President Obama is visiting at the moment, but that's, that's an aside, um, where they've um, some tourists were accidentally served dog meat in a restaurant in Bali, and apparently some of them, without realizing it, and some of them enjoyed it so much they went back for seconds. Now there's this big debate, you know, whether why do we eat cows but not dogs, and is there a difference? Should there be a difference? Well, if you're bothered by dogs, shouldn't you be bothered by cows? And so I think Think this it's good that these discussions are starting uh, to happen and at least question our social norms if anything so at least we come to our choices from a position of awareness as opposed to just default yeah i mean dogs are you can kind of understand a little bit but when you like if you take a horse which is very common in i was just like i said it was in uzbekistan and other places where horse meat is sort of like the the norm and some people get freaked out by that but like what's the difference between a horse and a cow there's not much difference and um some people are just like you know that's just unthinkable but um yeah it's just cultural norms it's um the associations and for that matter i you know if i uh, if i was in a lifeboat without food and i was starving and my friend died i'd eat them i think 
cannibal. I mean, I'd eat a human if it was necessary to do live. Do what you need to do. And I hope that they would eat me. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I think some of our restrictions are very, very um, ancient and sort of superstitious in some ways. Kevin, you do a lot of traveling and uh, you've spent a lot of time in the Bay Area. My question about is, is there something special that goes on in the Bay Area? I think about this a lot. I spend a bit of time in the Bay Area, New York, and, and you know, in the technology world, um, that's just been, you know, apparently something like 80% of venture capital returns uh, can be found within a you know, 50 kilometer radius from Stanford University of a world VC returns, something, something ridiculous like that. Um, is there something special in the in the DNA of the Bay Area because uh, the, there's the cycle of entrepreneurship that's been happening for so long? I mean, you travel a lot. How does it compare with maybe the spirit of the entrepreneurship or innovation in other parts of the world that you visit? Yeah, I, I think it's exhibiting basically what we call the network effects, the, the cascading of increasing returns. And so it, it might have started off a little exceptional, but its success has all has kind of made it even more exceptional. And that, and and the more it succeeds, the more exceptional it becomes. So um, I think originally, yes, there was a a long history, starting with the founding of California, and I mean the real founding of it in the uh, gold rush era when, um, you had all these young men coming in and there was no adult supervision and there was no government really to say no. Unlike anywhere else in the world where there was gold, the government did not claim it. I mean, they, 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 um, had a system of claims, but anybody who found it owned it. And that was different than almost anywhere in the world. So you had this gold rush where people were uh, not asking permission to do things, and then that kind of a free libertarian spirit continued to be present through the beatniks and the bohemians, the beatniks and the hippies. And so there was um, definitely a better to ask forgiveness than permission attitude of um, trying things, and it was far enough away from the centers of power in Washington, D.C., that the entrepreneurs who weren't called that, but the people who were crazy enough to to do a startup, um, had to rely on themselves and their friends for support. And there was, you know, there was this incubation of self-support and in the beginnings of what we would call startup culture, which was self-feeding, because every time somebody cashes out, on an IPO, they have more money than their lifestyle demands. And so what do they do with it? They invest it into other startups. And so you have this cascading avalanche of money that is hungry to, to go into another startup. And as soon as it gets out of a startup, it's put back into another one. And so, um, or two more, I should say. And so that that culture is now sort of the major invention of Silicon Valley, the major innovation, and it's become exceptional by the fact that it has succeeded. If I look around the world, there, you know, there's a couple other little places where some of that same kind of increasing returns is happening, um, like in Shenzhen, the Pearl Delta area, where there is a absolute true ecosystem of startups and uh, innovators um, but they're working in a, in a different, uh, they're working in the manufacturing area and they're kind of now a little bit of kind of a codependency. And a lot of people are trying to do software in their little Silicon Valley of X, but I think it's hard to have more than one. I think there's a winner kind a winner take all in the various domains. And so I, I don't expect that there'll be more Silicon Valleys with software I think we can expect, you know, there is a Silicon Valley for hardware, and that's in Shenzhen, but there might be yet a cluster, a Silicon Valley life thing for robotics. There might be one for AI. Uh, you know, Milan and Italy and places have a little bit of a sense for fashion. There's Hollywood, which is its own Silicon Valley for media. Um, there's Silicon Valley for finance in New York and London. 
So I think the future to me is these clusters of these ecosystems of um, self-reinforced kind of increasing returns around something that's big enough to have this ecosystem that needs an ecosystem and you you have its own internal money floating around. Like biotech right now happens to be located in basically in Silicon Valley, in San Francisco also. So we have two going on. You know, whether we can have more, I don't know. So, I mean, it remains to be seen whether there's, you know, anything inherent about other kind of clusters like that starting up around here. I know there's a lot of interest in food going on right now, but I think there was something special, but it was amplified by its success. And now it's special because it's special. Right. Right. Interesting. Kevin, let's let's talk about your book, The Inevitable. Um, the, the title of the book is called The Inevitable, Understanding the 12 Technological Forces That Will Shape Our Future. I've been listening to the audio version of the book, and it, I'm finding it absolutely fascinating because it makes so much sense. Being as someone who works in technology, I can feel how close we are to the to, – to a lot of the future that you paint and one of the points that I really loved in early on in the book where you you said that everyone working in technology well a lot of us working in technology we always feel like we've missed the boat right we've always feel like we've missed the latest trend and we've we've missed the internet wave or we've missed this wave and you make uh, you emphasize the point that all of this, the wave of the internet is really, has only just started. So if, if for someone listening to this podcast and the entrepreneurs and the young people, it's, you haven't missed anything. In, and in, as you point out in your book, in 20 years time, people are going to comment of, of how they may have missed the AI boat or similar, similar technologies or the, the VR boat. Yeah, I mean, a, a, another way of saying it is like, you know, this moment right now, is the absolute best moment in history, probably ever, not just to the past, but even the future, to, to start something. Because compared to the tools of the past, we've never had more and better tools accessible to more people for cheaper price with a bigger worldwide market than ever and cheaper money than ever. And so it's like, you know, not just you, but, you know, some kid in Jakarta has could, could have access to these tools and, and start something that could be favored by everybody in the world. And so in terms of where we have been, there has never been a better time to make something than right now. And that's also true compared to the future, because in the future, compared to where we'll be right now, there are no AI experts. There are no virtual reality experts compared to what we know in 30 years. There's no, there's no, uh, you know, uh, accessing experts. All these things are just at the very beginning, and so there's all this low-hanging fruit, like, you know, like domain names were in the in the 80s. There's all these low-hanging fruit available to some of the earliest pioneers and there are no experts you know we, we we really don't know what ai is we really don't know how vr works and so um you the listener out there has as much chance of discovering this as anybody else does and it's not a matter of having money because money is not going to buy you these these things it's going to be uh exploration it's going to be trying things it's going to be um, cobbling up the initial versions of something and because nobody knows how to do it you have a, as good of a chance of figuring that out as, as the richest corporation and probably more of a chance because the rich corporations are hobbled by their success they, they can't afford to dapple in areas that don't produce money and profit they can certainly have little teams um, doing things but they are often ignored those teams because they may discover something that they can't commercialize. I'm, I'm reminded of uh, of Apple. Um, the fact that I, one of the questions I asked the Apple engineers was, uh, "How come you guys didn't invent the web? Because you were online, you knew about HyperCard, you invented HyperCard, hyperlinks. That was something that that 
Bill Atkinson invented. So they knew about hypertexting and they knew about the web. How come they didn't invent the, and they knew about, you know, um, online stuff. How come we didn't invent the web? And we know what they said. Mm -hmm. They said we couldn't think of a business model for it. Interesting. And so a, a lot of these early things will apparently not have a business model. They won't be very profitable in the beginning, but um, they'll be available. And so compared to where we'll be, this is like an amazing time. And people in the gray beards of the future will look back and say, oh, I wish I really could have been alive and young in 2017 because that was when anything was possible with this stuff. Um, and you are alive right now at this moment. Kevin, uh, to, you know, on the fact that the internet is just beginning, um, I'd like your opinion on the fact that Evan Williams, one of the founders of Twitter, recently said that in many ways the internet has failed because it's resulted in a situation where extremes are awarded. Um, and there's an issue with trolling, there's an issue with abuse, there's an issue with you know, fake news. What are your thoughts on the fact that the, of the internet living up to its promise um, in today's environment? I had very low expectations. I lived online long before Ev did, mm -hmm. and, and it was full of trolling and flaming. That was that was the nature. So so I had no expectations that this was going to go away. It was present from the very beginning. So for Ev, I think he was maybe maybe a lot more idealistic than I was, but um, I never expected it to be this utopian it was full of trolling um flame wars from the very very beginning and that's sort of one of the things that we experienced on the well and sex the well invented some of these things um the well community i should say and i had no illusions that this was in any way utopia in fact the early stages of the internet you never revealed your real name, only under exceptional circumstances. And one of the reasons was you, you weren't quite sure who you were talking to and it would get quite intense. And I remember Usenet would be very controversial. So I agree with you. It, 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 it has always yeah. been there. However, I, I have always, in every place I logged on to from the very beginning, I've always used my real name for everything because I feel that one of the worst ideas in the world is anonymity. I think it's a really toxic thing that should be ex tolerated in very low doses with few exceptions and that people behave better when they're standing by their real name and have a real, real, real reputation. So I've always used my real name for everything. And I also assume whenever I send an email that it'll, it'll escape and be made public. So I write as if um, I can stand by whatever it is that I write. If you are hidden, if you are hiding behind a mask of anonymity, sooner or later you'll be unmasked, and then you have to deal with the fact that um, you may have said things that you can't really stand next to. The internet can and has always had this, in a way, false sense of intimacy. Email or chat can feel so private and intimate, but. Um, it's, it's just, yeah, I agree with you. To always assume that whatever you're typing or sending can be published on the front, front page of a newspaper. If you're not happy with that, yeah. don't, don't right. send it. Right. Kevin, let's, I want to, um, the breakdown of your book is really fascinating. I just want to quickly read for the listeners how you break down the forces that are going to shape the future because I found this really useful even just thinking in terms of my own business and you know as, as an entrepreneur you always you're trying to find that balance in, in, in skating to where the puck is but but not too far ahead and missing the puck so I found it as a really interesting um, sort of metaphor so I'll just quickly go through these forces um, that that are going to change the way we work learn and communicate Becoming, number one, becoming, moving from fixed products to always upgrading services and subscriptions. Number two, cognifying, making everything much smarter using cheap, powerful AI that we get from the cloud. Number three, flowing, depending on unstoppable streams in real time for everything. Number four, screening, turning all surfaces into screens. Number five, accessing, shifting society from one where we own assets to one where we will have access to services at all times. Six, sharing, collaboration at mass scale. You write, on my imaginary sharing meter index, we're still at two out of ten in terms of sharing. 
Filtering, harnessing intense personalization in order to anticipate our desires. Eight, remixing, unbundling existing products into their most primitive parts and then recombine in all possible ways. Nine, interacting, immersing ourselves inside our computers to maximize their engagement. 10. Tracking. Employing total surveillance for the benefit of citizens and consumers. 11. Questioning. Promoting good questions are far more valuable than good answers. I love that. 12. Beginning. Constructing a planetary system connecting all humans and machines into a global matrix. Boy, that, that one's um, going a little bit, uh, bit mind-bendy, but um, those are the 11 plus 1 forces, and I think it's just incredibly useful for anyone in the industry to, to go through each one and reflect on them. Yes, thank you. I um, appreciate that summary. And um, in regards to the last one, which is a little trippy of this kind of um, movement towards a planetary uh, superorganism, the, the one thing I would say, maybe a little closer to home that's not as distant or remote sounding, is the fact that um, there is, I think, a very broad opportunity of, uh, uh, available right now to thinking about collaborating on on a vast scale so r r right now uh you know there's like almost two billion people on facebook we, we but imagine what they could be harnessed to do in real time so we have a couple of, ex of examples of like a million people collaborating on something the the, the, the trivial one was the recent um april fool's day i'll call it a prank a april fool's day assignment on reddit called the place right. where um, there was a million pixels and people got to control those pixels to, to, to try and this. Yep. make a design. Well, 1 million people participated in 72 hours and the it was a phenomenal performance of, and, and a kind of, a, I don't know, a, a, a picture of uh, coopetition people who were cooperating and competing at the same time. And it was amazing. And it's kind of a trivial example of what you could do with a million people. I think there is within the range of five years, um, a tremendous opportunity for people to harness collaboration at scale. And, and Wikipedia is a kind of an ongoing example of that dealing with millions of contributors. It's not necessarily in real time. It's asynchronous, but you could do some amazing things and somebody will figure out how to begin to do that. And I think in terms of businesses, this is a huge opportunity to, in, um, to develop tools and assignments uh, and projects and services and products that will come out of um, you know, at least you know, just a mere a mere million people collaborating together. But we, you know, we could have ten million, we could have a hundred million, we could have a billion, we could have two billion. So I, I think we're just at the beginning of this. I think this is going to be the big thing that will just be surprising to people. Though something will happen, and everybody will be shocked out of their mind, kind of like Woodstock was in the '60s where everybody will appear suddenly and they don't know why they were there and they would do something amazing. And it's like, oh my gosh, if we can do that, we can do X and X and X. So I think that's real. That's not in the far distance future. It's not some science fiction fantasy. I think this is within five years. And I love, Kevin, how you've got such an optimistic view versus a dystopian view of technology. There's been a lot of talk about how AI and uh, robots together with weapons and, you know, will become, you know, self-replicating. And what, what I loved in your book as well is you talk about that, that as humans, we project our own type of intelligence onto uh, robots and, and devices, which is the wrong way of looking at things. Um, that, that just as a calculator is, is a lot better at certain types of intelligence that we, than we are, um, cognifying or wrapping an AI layer around so much in our life is going to be more like a calculator and less like um, humans made in our own image that we're going to go to war with. Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I, it's, it's not difficult, really, to imagine all the things that would go wrong with AI because, and, and by the way, you know, a, a lot of the images that we have have come from Hollywood who... Is it, they're masters, they're absolute 
geniuses at telling stories and dystopian worlds are just better for stories. They've got the drama and the heroes and the villains and they have all the necessary parts and it's really hard to make something better than a you know a dystopian future world. The 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 problem is is that um it's very hard to create a, a world that we want and want to live in without a, a vision of it, without some kind of imagination. And it's, and there are so few other positive futures of, of a future that we want to live in, a technological future. And so, um, you know, part of what I see is my job is to try and describe a, a vision, a plausible vision of a technological future that we'd want to live in. And um, I think there's going to be plenty of troubles and problems. I'm not a utopian. I don't want to make a utopian vision. I just want to make something that we're happy or, you know, that's friendly to us. But it, but there's going to be tons and tons of problems. It's not hard to think of them. Um, I think it's a little harder to think of the unintended benefits that, that might derive from them. And so – my kind of my job is, is to try and articulate what a possible plausible positive vision would be that still has problems i mean i want to acknowledge that they will have problems you know their ai and weaponization of ai is a problem cyber conflict is a problem um there'll be a whole new problems brought up by vr and we can think of those but the benefits are going to outweigh the problems because because they have in the past because they have for 200 years we have created a little bit more than we've destroyed every year and that few percent compounded is what we call progress we could change but it's more likely that we'll continue doing what we have on your point that we've created a little bit more than we destroyed every year i was i was astounded to read that um there's an estimated 10 million living species, but only about 1.5 to 1.8 million have even been named, and fewer than 1% of these have been studied enough to understand the basics of their ecological roles. I mean, that, that absolutely blew my mind. I just had no idea about that. And, and you're involved in the, the is it, do you pronounce it, the, the Linnean Enterprise? Well, it's called the All Species Inventory. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, there's an extension of the Linnean was the Swedish was a Swedish uh, scientist who gave us our classification system, and he began to, the this enterprise this, this challenge of identifying all the living species on the planet, and that was what he began. Um, and as you mentioned, we're not even sure how far short we are. The the the, the number of species on the planet ranges between three million third to thirty million. Are most of those and, insects? Yes, most of those are very, very tiny. Right. Insects and below. We probably have identified, you know, 99% of the mammals, probably 99% of the birds. We have a lot of insects and smaller creatures and the fungi and, you know, so so so, so it's in the small stuff that we don't know. And plants, there's, there's a number of plants too. But what... Each of those, I mean, I was just reading a, a piece today about a guy who's going around uh, collecting bacteria from the weirdest places because each of these species is a gene bank. They have, they all have three billion years of evolution and they've accumulated some wisdom. They've solved some problems and that those solutions are kind of embedded in their genes and so all these things, this is where our antibiotics come from. This is where a lot of drugs come from. These, these, each, of the, each of these species holds some solutions. So, and so we want to we save and know all of them. And we don't have anywhere, you know, we're, we're a few percent in. So we started this campaign to try and finish off, to, to complete the – survey of all the living species on this planet that we co-inhabit with in 25 years. And the argument was something like, you know, if we landed on Mars and we discovered life on Mars, we would probably set off to do some kind of survey. Oh, what else is, you know, wh wh what else is on this planet? 
and we haven't done that on our own home planet. You know, we we we're, we haven't done a systematic attempt to catalog all the life on this planet. And so, there was to do that though, at the current rates that was being done, it was being done in the exact same way that Darwin was doing it, which is really slow. It's really inefficient. It was just terrible. We what we're, we were trying to galvanize, use new technology to in some way accelerate this because it just couldn't continue the way it was being done. But it's that the taxonomists are a very, very conservative bunch. But we needed new technology, something like a, you know, like a Star Trek tricorder or something that could examine, you know, and, and identify the new pieces, the new species that you picked up. But in fact, what we really needed was a machine that just did one that just gave one answer that just gave one signal and that would be enough and that signal all would have to say is whether this was known to science or not if you could just if you could give it samples have a look at samples or put a little piece of something if it could identify a sample that you of living thing a living creature or a living plant and it could tell you whether or not this was known to science that's all we would need to accelerate the identification because you could walk through the woods or the jungle and you could say, it'd say, I know this, I know this, I know this. It wouldn't even have to tell you what it was. It says, I know this, I know this. And then eventually you say, oh, I, I'd never seen this before. Then that's the one you collect. That's the one you send to the experts and they can spend all the time. Right now the experts are spending all the time looking at things that actually people know about, but nobody knew that they knew it. So that does not exist. We were trying to accelerate the invention of that, but um, maybe with DNA, you know, real time, that's probably the way it'll be solved. You know, you drop a little leg in or a little bit, a bit of leaf and it says, oh, I know what this is. Um, but that's what we were trying to do. We were unsuccessful. And as far as we got was trying to make an encyclopedia of the known Specimens, because even that didn't did not exist when we began. There was no master list of all the known species. Um, they weren't digitized. They weren't. They were just in dusty books. They were not organized. And so my goal was to make a web page for every species. That's now called the Encyclopedia of Life Project, and that's really the only thing that has continued out of that because we were unsuccessful in developing new technology or even getting the funding to do that. And so um, the Encyclopedia of Life is the only thing that has continued. Interesting. Kevin, I know time is, is, is against us, but one, uh, one final point which I found so interesting in your book is, uh, you know, humans, humans are blessed and cursed with self-awareness. And one of the things that we struggle with is to find meaning and purpose. And you make the point that artificial intelligence will ironically help define humanity or as you, as you say artificial aliens these aliens that we will create semi in our own image will help us self reflect of what it actually means to be human and I've, i found that incredibly interesting yeah we're we're seeing some of that already as we try to teach these um automated driving systems the ais that are embedded in like the google self driving cars and others they have to make these decisions uh on the fly like I say in an accident, whether they should favor the safety of the passenger or the safety of, say, the pedestrians or other drivers, that's an ethical decision. And um, we have a whole bunch of people who are trying to code into, to program into these things, their, their sense of ethics, which is not that difficult to do because ethics in some ways is a code. Excuse me. The difficulty is, is that when we start to examine our own ethics and and moral systems to to try to reduce it to a code. We, we we're, we're we're confronted with the fact that our own ethics are very inconsistent, um, shallow, not logical, uh, not very deep, and then we're we're stuck. And so th that has sort of challenged us to deepen and make it more consistent and, and make it better, basically to improve our own ethics and morality and it's like it's like kind of like having children where you're kind of teaching your children you're getting better well um, in order to communicate it to the AIs and robots we actually have to sharpen up our own version of it and 
in that process, we're going to make ourselves better. And we saw the same thing with chess. When when the, when this AI Deep Blue beat the world's best chess player, you would think, well, that's the end of a of humans playing chess. But it wasn't actually. What happened was all these people started to play against computer chess became really really cheap, and today the best player that has ever lived has become really good because they've been playing against computers. So it just made it made humans better at it. So 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 already the the, the AIs are teaching us how to be better chess players. They'll teach us how to be better pilots. They'll teach us how to be better judges and ethics and teachers. And so they are helping us to make ourselves better. And so there's two things going on. It's one is they're going to help us understand who we are, and then they're going to help us change who we are. And so they'll help us decide who we want to be. And um, I, so this is the grand kind of transhumanist enterprise, which is that all this technology is redefining us or helping us to, to define ourselves and then helping us to redefine ourselves. And so I think this is a, kind of like the, the biggest, grandest project of all which is deciding who we are and deciding who we want to be. We're using these things that we've invented to help us do that. And this project of who do we want humans to be um, is, is the biggest project that we could imagine right now. So interesting. And uh, um, Kevin, you were an advisor for St uh, on the Steven Spielberg movie Minority Report. Any new movies with him in the pipeline that you can reveal? I don't have any inside information, but I know that he's been working on the um, Ready Player One, the the, the virtual reality. Um, there's a great novel called Ready Player One, very funny, which is about VR. And I know that he's been working on that and that there's a VR component somewhere along the line. I don't have any inside information beyond that. Right. So, no, um, I, I think the idea of build, world building is really cool and um, I enjoy doing it. I may do more of it in the future, but I have Spielberg hasn't invited us back to do it again. Great. Um, Kevin Kelly, the author of The Inevitable, Understanding the 12 Technological Forces That Will Shape Our Future. It's a fantastic book. I've been listening to the audio, ver audio version, and it is just so much food for thought. I really uh, appreciate you joining us on the podcast, and um, no doubt everyone will find this uh, incredibly interesting. Thanks again for your time. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me and uh, have the best day.